Do you want to learn how to use Capistrano to deploy your Ruby on Rails application to an Amazon EC2 instance in the cloud? If so, stick around to find out how. I'm Thomas with Branchos Digital. I'm a full stack developer obsessed with learning. If you're interested in learning full stack, please subscribe below to receive new content. In this AWS Rails tutorial, we're going to walk through how to use the Capistrano gem to create a deployment for your Ruby on Rails application that will deploy to an Amazon EC2 instance. The application we're going to be deploying is the AWS Rails app. If you need to catch up with that application, I'll link to the video here in the cards and the description below. The server we're going to be deploying to is an Amazon EC2 instance that we created in a previous tutorial. Again, I'll link that here in the cards and then down here in the description. Capistrano is a framework for building automated deployment scripts. Capistrano deployments are not limited to Ruby or Ruby on Rails. In fact, you can deploy PHP or Java if you're into that sort of thing with Capistrano as well. With all that out of the way, let's get into learning how to create a Capistrano deployment for our Ruby on Rails application in an Amazon EC2 instance in the cloud. That was a lot of buzzwords. Keyword, 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 keyword. I feel like now is when I'm supposed to like put my hand over and cover as like a cool transition. In the previous tutorial, we got our code committed to a Git repository and then pushed up to GitHub. If you haven't seen that video yet, I recommend you watch that first as that's a requirement to complete this video. I'll link that in the card in the top right corner and the description below. With that out of the way, let's open up the gem file and add the gems we need. First, we can clean this up a bit by getting rid of some of the unnecessary comments. Here in the development group, we're gonna paste our gems. First, you'll see Capistrano, Capistrano Rails, and Capistrano RBM. These are required to complete our deployment. The Capistrano DB Tasks gem is just a gem I always include, and I have covered it in a previous tutorial. So if you'd like to use that gem, just check that tutorial out. Uh, basically, what this does is it allows you to sync data quickly from production down to your local machine or vice versa. It's really easy to push and pull your data with this gem. I tend to just install this gem in every application I create and I always end up using it. If you'd like to watch that video, I'll link that in the card and then in the description below. With that, let's save and run bundle install. Now that we have our gems installed in our application, let's install Capistrano. Bundle exec cap install. This will create the files you need to deploy using Capistrano. As you can see below, it created some config deployment files for us and some uh, various environments, staging and production, as well as a cap file. So let's switch over to our application and check out these files. First, we'll open up the cap file in the root of our application. Here, we're just gonna paste our setup in and walk through it. We need to include the Capistrano setup deploy bundler rails and RBM. Next, we're setting the RBM type to user and the RBM Ruby to 271. That's our current Ruby version that we have installed on our EC2 instance that we created in the previous tutorial. Next, we're telling Capistrano that we're using get for our source control manager, and we're loading all of the Capistrano rake tasks. So let's go ahead and save this. Next, let's go into config deploy. There are a lot of comments here. Again, we're just gonna paste our code in here and walk through it. The first line here just pins our version of Capistrano. Next, we're requiring the Capistrano DB Tasks library. If you're not including this gem, you're not gonna wanna require this line of code. Since I use this gem so frequently, I just keep this part of my standard deploy. Next, you're gonna give your application a name. In this case, it's just gonna be AWS-Rails. Next, you need to input the repo URL. So let's go grab that from GitHub now. Once on GitHub, navigate to the repository of the application you'd wish to deploy. Click on the clone or download button. And you'll click the button here to copy with SSH. I'm going to paste this here in the repo URL. Next is deploy to. So this is where on our new EC2 instance that we created previously, this is going to deploy. So it's going to go into the home deploy AWS-Rails folder. The next line here is optional. When working with branches, it's sometimes useful to be able to deploy a branch before ever merging it into master. So this code will allow us to pass an environment variable during our deploy to deploy a specific branch of code up to 
staging, or production. We can talk more about this later, but for now, just know that this is a, a useful convenience when working with various branches. Next, we have our linked files and linked directories. The only files we're going to link is our database.yaml and our master.key. Linking our master.key allows Rails to access our encrypted secrets. Keep releases and keep assets refers to how many versions or how many deploys we want to keep on the server at any one time. Capistrano keeps track of the last deployment, and that's what will show up when we visit our web page. If we deploy a bug, we can always roll back. So if we keep three versions up there, we can roll back twice without issue. DB clean and DB remote clean are also related to the Capistrano DB tasks gem. These two settings can be ignored if you're not using the Capistrano DB task gems. You're going to want to remove those. This next block of code here just restarts our application after every single deploy. Next, we need to go into the config deploy folder and set things up for our production deploy. So let's clear this out and paste in our current code. Here we need to pass in the server IP for the production server that we created in the previous EC2 tutorial. Let's switch over to the browser and grab that from Amazon now. So you're gonna to wanna to log into the console, go to EC2, running instances, and then grab your public IP. We'll paste that in and save that. At this point, we're almost ready to deploy. Let's flip back over to the terminal and SSH into the server. In this case, I'm using SSH config that I've set up to AWS-Rails to point to our production server and log us in. If you don't have SSH config set up, I'll link that video in the card in the description below. When creating the server, we generated a set of SSH keys. We need to retrieve the public key and then put that in GitHub as a deploy key. This will allow the server to pull the code from this private repository during deployment. To output this key, we're just going to say cat tilde slash dot ssh id rsa dot pub. We're going to copy this key and go back to our browser to GitHub. Within this repository, you're going to click the settings button. In the left hand menu, you're going to click deploy keys and click add deploy key. Here you'll paste in the key you just copied. Then above, you're going to give it a title. I typically name my key something very similar to the name of the instance in Amazon so that I know these two are tied together. Then you'll click add key. Here it's going to request your password. Click confirm. Now that our deploy key is in GitHub, GitHub will allow our server to pull this code down as part of our Capistrano deployment. I just want to interrupt for one second and see if you're finding value. Please subscribe below, hit the like button, turn on the bell notification for, for future notifications of, of content like this. And if you are, we have a limited time offer our coworker here, Bear, will perform one trick per subscriber. Yes. Down. Yes. Roll over. Good boy. You're the goodest boy. Good boy. Down. Down. Oh my gosh. We're going viral, Bear. Finally, before we deploy our code, we need to make a few changes. Currently on our videos page, any logged in user could edit or destroy our videos. And that's really not what we want. Any user could also create a new video. We really don't want that either. Let's go ahead and scope some of these to the admin role that we created. First in the routes, we're gonna disable some of these routes on the video resource if they're not logged in as an admin user. So instead of just having the resource videos route here, we're gonna limit the unauthenticated routes to just the index and show page. If the user's logged in and they're an admin, then they can have all of the resource routes for videos. Now that we've got the routes accounted for, we still need to hide some of the links from the view. As you can see here on the show page, there are links to show, edit, and destroy. So let's hide those from anybody who's not an admin user. In videos index, you can see we have a new video link here. We'll scope this new video link to logged in users who are one of our admins. So here you can see we're checking first is a user signed in. And then also after we know that there is a current user signed in, we can check that current user variable that device gives us and see if the admin flag is set for true to them. If both of these conditions are met, then they can have access to the new video link. We're gonna do the same thing on the show page. Let's do something similar here where we're iterating and rendering out all of our videos. For our video partial, let's go ahead and wrap the edit and destroy links in a similar conditional block. Instead of having an additional show link, let's just make the video title a link as well. As you can see, I'm not currently logged in. 
all of the links to edit and destroy as well as the link to create new videos has been hidden from me since I'm not a logged in user and therefore not an admin. And the show page once again will wrap this in a block. Next, let's clean up the show page a little bit more by hiding the position and instead outputting similar iframe and video title. Here we need to ensure that we're using the add video instance. Here, since we're on this page though, we can remove the link to helper. That'll work for now. We'll continue to clean up styling in future tutorials. Now say an unlogged user attempted to still access this edit link. They'll be requested to log in. After successfully signing in, you will then be able to edit the video only because I'm an admin user. If instead I log out, if I log back in as the user we created for Bear, my dog, you can see he's not an admin. So if we go to the videos page, the links are hidden. If we try to hit the edit link, you can see that doesn't work. Since we're not an admin, that route does not exist. As you can see, this prevents Bear from doing something he shouldn't. If only I could do that in real life. In the future, we can do a tutorial on more appropriate access control logic, but for now, this will work. One last item we want to ensure we change is in the config initializers device. We want to set our mailing sender to our SES email. Now we need to commit and deploy all of our code. Run git add dot to stage all of the new files. Git commit dash m. We'll just say deploy in progress. Finally, get push to push these changes up to GitHub. Then we'll run bundle exec cap production deploy. The errors in Capistrano are pretty useful. This fails as we have not yet added our linked files to our server. So we're going to open up another tab and then SSH back into the server. Now you can see Capistrano has already started to create the folder. So if you cd into AWS-Rails, we're going to go into the shared directory, config. As you can see from the error message, this is where Capistrano is expecting to find a database.yaml as well as a master.key file. So let's go ahead and add those to the server now. Let's open up our database.yml file to check it out. There's lots of comments here that will help explain the file. For our purposes, we're just gonna remove these so we can see everything all at once. As you can see, there's a default block that sets some options that we'll use in all environments. Next, you can see each one of the three environments, development, test, and production with their own unique settings. So here in production, we're going to edit this to match the settings on our current EC2 instance. We called our user deploy, so let's change that now. Next, for the password, instead of passing this in as an environment variable, we're going to pass in our Postgres database password using encrypted credentials. So here we're going to access Rails application credentials, and we're going to dig out production database underscore password. This doesn't yet exist, so let's go create that now. To update our credentials, we'll type in Rails credentials edit. Here we have the ADBS credentials that we added as part of our SES email tutorial. Here we'll create a block for production, then we're going to scope DB password underneath that. Then we're going to go ahead and paste in the password for the Postgres database on the EC2 instance. Credentials are a special type of file, so clicking save here doesn't finish the job. We need to actually click the X so that file will be closed, encrypted, and then saved for us. Now that our database file is complete, let's add this to the server. We'll paste in our password, and then we'll paste in our code. We'll break out with control X and say, yes, we'd like to save and write it to database.yml. Next, we need to add our master.key. This is the last of the files we're gonna be adding manually. We'll flip back over to our project and grab the key. And then paste it in and save. Next, let's go back to our local terminal and try to deploy again. So the next thing we need to do is commit and deploy all of our code. We'll run git status to see what's still outstanding. Git add dot to stage all of this code for commit. Running git status again, you can see it's staged. Git commit dash m along with a commit message. Finally, we can run git push to get this code up to our remote repository in GitHub. And then we can deploy our new code. Bundle exec cap production deploy. 
Now that that's complete, let's jump back into the ADBS console and update our root 53 domain ADBS Rails so that it points to our new server. In the console under root 53, we're going to click into our adbsrails.com domain. We're going to click into the A record and change this from an alias record to our new IP. Then we'll go ahead and save. Next, we want to update the www version. In this case, we're going to change it to a C name. It's no longer an alias. And instead, we're going to redirect to aws-rails.com. We'll go ahead and save. If we try to load our newly deployed application, you can see nothing's rendering. So that means we must have something wrong. Let's go ahead and SSH back into our new EC2 instance to ensure that we have everything set up correctly. As you can see, we've deployed to the folder aws-rails, but when we output our aws-rails.com nginx config, you can see we're pointing to aws underscore rails. Let's go ahead and update that now. Here we're just gonna change the underscore to a dash. Next, let's go ahead and restart Nginx to ensure that this new configuration gets picked up. Pseudo service Nginx restart can accomplish that for us. Okay, now we can refresh the page, but we have to remove the S as this is no longer secure. There you can see the new site that we've successfully deployed to our AWS server. So why is this no longer secure? Previously, when this was an S3 website, we were able to attach our SSL certificate to our CloudFront distribution. In this case, since we're no longer using a CloudFront distribution, our SSL certificate is no longer attached. You don't have the ability in Amazon to, to attach an SSL certificate to an EC2 instance. Rather, you typically would attach this to a load balancer. Since we don't yet have a load balancer, we're gonna save that for a future tutorial. But as you can see, we've successfully deployed our Rails application into our Amazon EC2 instance. Feel free to go to aws-rails.com and sign up if you'd like. There's not a ton of functionality yet, but there will be soon as we continue to build. As always, please remember to like and subscribe, add questions or requests you have in the comment section below, and I'll catch you in the next AWS Rails tutorial.